Okay, we're coming into our second set of notes on this topic, um, and we were talking about previously about how the net area between the velocity curve and the x-axis, so underneath, between um, V of T and the x-axis or t-axis, is equal to the accumulation or net change in your quantity. And we did learn in the last set of notes that when the velocity curve is above the x-axis, then you have a positive accumulation, your quantity increases. And we learned that when the velocity curve, the rate was below the x-axis, your accumulation was negative and you were losing uh, quantity. So the quantity was decreasing. And so the next question that we have is kind of this idea. We have some motorcyclists who would like to be on the road and they want to experiment with how fast their vehicles can go. Although I would highly recommend on a motorcycle to go the speed limit. After you are recording some data, they wonder how is their distance traveled related to the velocity over the trip? And so part of the idea is to understand how that distance traveled is actually related to this net area or this accumulation that we were working on in the last one. Now, when you're looking at the first example, okay, he's going to put it on cruise control and drive at 70 miles per hour. So we're going to do our velocity curve. So V of T, units, miles per hour, is going to be on your y-axis. We're going to travel at that 70 miles per hour for one and a half hours. So there's one, would be a half, and then this would be 1.5. And so we're going to do that for 1.5 hours. And so we just want to sketch a graph of our velocity. And the thing that's interesting about this is, one, this is a constant velocity. And the other thing that's interesting to note is that it is a positive velocity. So when I'm taking a look at this and taking a look at my accumulation function, we know that we have a positive accumulation, which means that our quantity is going to be increasing. Now, in terms of talking about what that quantity is, let's think about how we did the net area as we did in the last one. So when we take a look at this and we're looking at our net area, what we're looking at is that area under the curve. So up until we get to this 1.5, this area underneath of the curve is going to represent your net area or your net change that we were looking for. And that net area, again, is going to be the width of the rectangle, 1.5 hours, times the height of the rectangle, 70 miles per hour. And so if we were going to calculate what does that mean, this area, that because, okay, now this is only because, we'll put a little star here, because V of T was greater than zero, the net area is going to equal the distance traveled. Now I'm making a point of this because that does not, that is not a conclusion that I would make if the velocity is negative. Because you gain, you lose. So it's a different scenario when we look at that net area. But when your velocity is positive for the entire time, then that net area equals the distance traveled. So we calculate our net area. We would take our uh, 70 miles per hour, so our nice unit there, our rate times my time, 1.5 hours, and of course the hours would cancel and we would leave, end up with 105 miles. Now because they traveled in the same direction for the entire time, and I know that because the velocity was always positive, so they were always moving forward, their total distance traveled was 105 miles. Okay, so then we go down and let's look at a different scenario. So in this one, instead of having a constant velocity, like we did in the previous one, now I'm going to have a velocity given by a linear function. So now I have a velocity that is increasing over time, increasing because the slope of that line is positive. If we do a quick sketch of this velocity curve, it has a uh, y-intercept of 5, and it has a slope of 6, so we need to go up 
six and then over one, and we would plot that, and then we would go up another six. Uh, what am I, I'm at 11, so another six would be 17 and over one, and then go up another six, that would put me at 23 and over one. So we get a nice little sketch of this velocity curve. So put that in there, let me add my point back in for the middle. Okay, so we get our velocity curve going. So once we have it graphed, and we want to know how much distance do you cover over the time period. So again, just like we had up here, because V of T was greater than zero, this net area that we're looking at is going to equal the distance traveled. Now, in this one, we don't have a nice little rectangle, but I still want to take a look at that area under the curve um, for the three-hour period. When I look at that area, it is going to be a geometric figure, though. So we could take that and shape that in and we we'll say what kind of a shape geometrically do I have here? Could I still calculate that area fairly easily? And hopefully your answer is well yes, of course. This shape is a trapezoid. And so like I said in the last set of notes, you do want to remember that the area formula for a trapezoid is the average of the basis times the height. Now, when we're calculating this area, the one thing that's a little weird about this is that my trapezoid doesn't have the bases on the bottom and the top. The bases are on left and right. So this would be base one, this would be base two, and then the height is going to be this distance right here. So it's kind of a little weird because it's on its side, but we can still calculate that area fairly easily. Base 1 is going to be your y-intercept, so base 1 is 5. Base 2 is going to be the y-value of the point up here, and that y-value is the f of 3, or the function value of 3, but our function name is velocity, so it would be v of 3, which is going to be 23. So we have those two in, so my distance traveled over here would be base 1, plus the base 2 divided by 2 times, and then the height is going to be the change in hours that we had down here at the bottom, and that was for 3 hours. If you look at your units, the height, remember, is your rate, so this is going to be your miles per hour times your 3 hours, and that's going to give us how many miles we've traveled. Just, just do the arithmetic, it's going to end up being... 42 miles, okay? So both of these examples are this idea, two things. One, that when velocity is positive, your net area is your distance traveled. And two, when the shape under the curve, the area you're trying to calculate, your net areas, if they are geometric shapes, then they are very easy to calculate. So we'll say when v of t is, I'm going to put it in quotation marks, nice, then the area can be calculated using geometry. So when I say using geometry, I want the area of a rectangle, area of a trapezoid, area of a triangle, and even area of a semicircle, because if you have, notice I said semicircle because it's a function, but we do want to make sure that we can kind of calculate that area. All right, now the next thing that we're going to do is we're going to say, well, what if Jada is riding her motorcycle? Again, we have a positive velocity, so V of T is greater than zero on our domain of interest for zero to 10, and our graph is shown below. Now, the first thing is that we're going to say, well, I would like to estimate what this is. So how can we use this graph to determine how far Jada has traveled? We're still going to look at it as the net area is going to equal the total distance traveled because V of T was greater than zero. And if I were to ask you a question, okay, obviously we're going to have a little bit more problem calculating this net area, but we're looking at it in terms of 
how we can estimate this. Now, when was she going the fastest? That's the next question on here. During which one hour interval is data accumulating the most kilometers? So because the accumulation has to do with the area, she would accumulate the most kilometers when you have the most area. When the time interval under your curve, under V of T, has the most area. And so when we look at our curve, where we would have the most area would end up being over here on the right side, because obviously with the height, since the hours are kind of related to this idea of almost like a rectangular trapezoid kind of area, that would be the place where you have the most area. So the answer to this question is, when does this happen? I'll just add it to the beginning here, at, um, or let's say on, uh, or between t equal to 9 hours and t equal to 10 hours. And the reason would be because when the time interval under v of t has the most area, you will accumulate the most. Now, not all areas can be found using simple geometric formulas like we discussed on the previous page. So what we have here is we want to approximate the area. So to keep things simple, we're going to use 10 rectangles of equal width. And so at that point, what I want to do is let's talk about how are we going to determine the height of each rectangle. How we were going to determine it is to realize that the heights of the rectangle, depending on how you sketch it, um, and this one, you have different options. I could use say, this point right here and kind of look at the rectangle underneath of the curve like that. I tell you like a little underestimate. I could pick the point over here and maybe draw the rectangle, and then if I include that in, that would give me an overestimate. Notice that this one is your left endpoint. This side would be your right endpoint. So those are going to be some options as we are calculating what we're going to do. But notice there's a third option in there. We could actually kind of take the midpoint of these and draw a rectangle. And in that rectangle, when I'm looking at it, I'm just going to kind of shade it in. All right, maybe that's a better estimate, but I could certainly use the midpoint as an option for the height of the rectangle. But in, in general, what's actually going to end up on this is the, the key idea is that what we're going to do is we're going to use the function value to calculate the height. So use a function value, and I'm going to call it f of x sub i, and I'm going to say where x sub i can be a left endpoint, a right endpoint, the midpoint of the interval, and or technically, and we'll talk about why this is in the next video, any point in the interval. Typically, when we're doing our own estimates, we're going to choose, they'll tell you whether to do the left, the right, or the midpoint in terms of your calculations for this, but our function value is going to come from that. But in the end, we'll talk about why it doesn't really matter what you have. All right, so now what I'm going to do here is I'm going to pause the video and I'll restart it on the next one. But what I would like each of you to do before you restart and go to the part two of this video, I want anybody whose name begins with A to G, so your last name is A to G, I would like you guys to do left endpoint. If you are H to P, I would like you to do right endpoint. And if you are Q to Z, I would like you to do midpoint for this problem. And I'll show um, kind of the key that goes for each of these at the end. You're going to record your height with an area of each rectangle. You are going to find your best guess for the distance. And then you're going to talk about whether you have an over or an underestimate. And then based on the things that we've already talked about in class, try to give an idea of how can we get an even better approximation. So we're going to stop this video here. You guys take care of that and come back, and I will have the key to that ready for you.